come back as you leave today, please go ahead and bless your giving back there, paying your tithes. God honors your faithfulness. If, uh, Brother Josh, if you'll put 1 Peter 2 and 9 up there. 1 Peter 2 and 9. This next uh, couple of weeks as you're preparing for the uh, we're preparing for the Thanksgiving dinner. I uh, want to let you know that Sister Duncan and I will be leaving this weekend. Uh, we'll be traveling some and uh, riding through southern Missouri and uh, spending some time with my mom in East Texas and then working our way back up here uh, sometime the, the, during the week before the Thanksgiving service and uh, I share that to say this we'll be celebrating our 25th anniversary during that time and just going to do some sightseeing and some relaxing and uh, my wife hasn't had a chance to go home to my home in nearly 10 years and uh, she's looking forward to a chance to go back and, and uh, see see my mom as well but during that time unless they have added some cell towers uh, in Shelby County there's one spot about 450 yards from the house where I can stand out in the pasture and get a signal. And uh, beyond that, it's a five mile drive to the nearest store that has Wi Fi. My mom has no use for the internet very much, and so she still has dial up for what little bit she does online. Uh, if you need to reach me, uh, the Strouds will have the, the home number there. And. Uh, Feel free to, to write any calls to them that are of emergency nature. If you try to reach me, leave a voicemail for me or a text. I will get it, but understand it may very well be a 24-hour period before I actually get to a place where I get a signal. And uh, so I know it sounds like it's out in the boonies, and it really, really and truly is. It's a, a sparsely populated county right on Clay Bend Lake, uh, surrounded by Sabine National Forest. And my mother and father-in-law, the first time they went to visit my folks and get to meet them, they drove from Center, Texas and got about halfway there and thought, surely we've made a wrong turn because there's just nothing here. And indeed, there is about a 20-mile stretch in which you drive through nothing but trees. And so they turned around and went back, made a phone call, and then had to go back the same way again. So uh, if you have an emergency, please contact the Strouds. And if you need to leave a message or want to leave a message for us, leave it. Feel free to. Just understand, don't be offended if it takes 24 hours to get back to you. I uh, left here Thursday night feeling very peaceful about the will of God being done and the spirit of unity that was here during the election. And uh, I want to say a whole lot about that. Just I felt a sweet, in my spirit, a sweet peace that things were happening the way they're supposed to happen. And uh, thankful for that. This morning, I'm reminded that everybody has different tastes. Some of you here this morning hate country music. Some of you here this morning like the twang of a steel guitar. Uh, my son and I have joked back and forth about over the years about him and his use of uh, his kids can be dismissed. I'm sorry. I'm just cruising right along. About how his music, he would like the, um, he calls it distortion, and uh, I call it rhythmic static. And uh, it's kind of funny, but everybody has their own taste. Uh, I told Sister Duncan, we were actually planning on leaving. We were actually splitting our trip in two. And the weirdest things just happened in life. We both chipped a tooth this last week and had teeth break. The same tooth on both of us and they broke in the same place. Just weird and uh, I can't get my filling done until Tuesday and she couldn't get hers done until Wednesday so we had to rearrange our travel plans. And uh, I, She had planned on taking me out to eat for her. my birthday the other day and I asked her for a rain check. I said just wait till we head on our trip and once we get somewhere south of the Mesa of Dixon Line all I ask is that we stop at one place where I can go into a buffet, and I don't care what they have on there as long as they have catfish and hush puppies. Because I'll probably just pull my chair up to the to the buffet table and make myself at home. And uh, of course she prefers 
uh, a white flaky fish that's more of a cod or a northern type and, and likes it baked with lemon juice and all these little pieces of grass sprinkled on it and all that kind of stuff. And that's, that's good that way too. But just different tastes. And a few weeks ago, we uh, uh, just on a whim, we had to go to uh, uh, Marshall to uh, make a delivery. And I said, well, you know what? I've heard people talk about going to um, uh, Battle Creek all the time to go shopping. Well, she misunderstood. She thought I was going to go shopping. No, I just was saying I've heard people go there for shopping. I said, let's go see what's there, what, how big a town it is, and, and see, uh, you know, see what kind of restaurants they have. And we got there. and. Uh, she said, pick out a place that you want. You're the one that came here. Just don't give any regard to what I want. So pick out something that you would like. Well, glory. <laughs> so I did some looking and scanning through the, the restaurants on my phone. And, and uh, never heard of it before, but there's two branches. But in Kalamazoo uh, and in uh, Battle Creek, they have a place called Hogzilla. It's a fast food barbecue joint. And uh, not, too, not too bad. Not too bad. They got a little buffet set out so you can get pulled smoked pork or pulled smoked chicken or uh, rib tips, which are pretty good. And Sister Duncan would say she wouldn't say it was pretty good. She didn't really care for it, but uh, macaroni and cheese and the baked beans were good, she would tell you. And of course, I don't want to taste that on She liked that. But you know what? I got my fill and she got her fill, but we got fills of different things because we each have different, different tastes. And uh, there's some restaurants that, that uh, she likes, and I just couldn't, I could care less about. When we went to see my son James, we went to a, a place that James, James picked up. It was a Thai restaurant, really nice, really formal. So, mm, it's okay. And uh, then we went to, of course, James is doing the vegetarian thing. It has been for years, and he took us to a vegetarian restaurant. And I'm like, seriously, no, if you're going to you know, call everything by the name of a fried dish and just and substitute tofu for me, why bother? And uh, I thought at least I'll get a good salad. And their lettuce was warm and limp. And I'm like, it was just disgusting to me. And then uh, the next day after church, we went to a, uh, an Indian restaurant. And uh, as much as I love Tex-Mex and barbecue and catfish, I don't like curry. And you may have heard me say that in the past. And they loved it. They absolutely loved it. I found a couple things I liked, and I, I got full. And uh, I just, I, you know, you don't really care about my eating habits, but I just talk about it for a minute because it just points out, you know, everybody has their own, their own taste, and people will choose what they want given the opportunity. And this morning, I want you to understand that there is absolutely nobody in heaven or on earth that twists God's arm. There's not a war going on between Satan and God. There's a war going on against us by Satan that God at the appointed time will say, okay, enough's enough, and He will step in and finish things up. There's not a battle between God and evil. There's a battle between flesh and evil. And in this world that we live that is under attack, that has all the, the problems that we can preach about, this morning I didn't come to you to, to present problems to you. I didn't come to you to present difficulties to you. Uh, but I wanted to just share something the Lord laid on my heart this morning. And I can honestly say that two of the Strongs and Strouds picked out this morning fit so well. And that's what you've got honor for the last couple of years. This has been a blessing because so many times without y'all have a clue what I'm preaching, you'll always have one or two that just flow perfectly with what I wanted to speak on. But this morning I want to share this one verse of Scripture with you. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. There, in the first part of that verse there, there are several constructions that I understand there are people in this room that could do a much better job than I could have ever done diagramming a sentence. But there are some adjectives in the first part of that sentence that I want to just focus on for a few minutes here this morning as I 
share what the Lord was laying on my heart about this verse. One, chosen. Two, royal. Three, holy. And then special. Now there's, those are all adjectives to describe something. And I, I began talking to you this morning about how, you know, given my choices, I'm going to choose something different than my wife would choose. You parents choose something different than your kids would choose. And each one of you would choose something different than the person across the aisle from you this morning. Because, go ahead and leave that verse up there if you don't mind this morning. We're going to work our way through it. This, this concept of choosing means you get to make a choice. Now, you understand that when we go to a, a meal and we sit down, and especially if you're going to one of these buffet type meals that really none of us ever should, but we do sometimes, you're making choices. And as you go along the buffet table, you've got a plate that is only a certain size and diameter. It'll only hold so much food. Now, I went to a family reunion one time to one of my aunts, and we made a big joke about it, but she got a cookie sheet and went through and filled the cookie sheet up with these from the, the dinner table. And, you know, we all gave her a hard time about it, and she hammed it up and thought it was really, really funny, and he guess that was on there too. But your plate's only so big. So you go through there and you make choices. And I can guarantee you tomorrow, if James and I went to up here to China Wall, when we sit down, he could probably tell you what I'll have lined out on my plate. And where? Because I'm a creature of habit, for better or for worse. And I could probably tell you what James's plate will look like, because he too is a creature of habit. And he will make his choices specifically to please Him. He won't choose something just because He knows it pleases me. And likewise, I'm not going to choose something just because it pleases Him. The pastor, you're belaboring the obvious. Yes, I am. I choose what pleases me because it pleases me and I don't choose what I don't choose because it doesn't please me. And in doing so, I choose to exclude some things from my inner being. Maybe an awkward way of saying that. This morning the Bible says you are a chosen people. That means God selected you. It wasn't an accident that you found your way to a Pentecostal church. It wasn't an accident that God filled you with the Holy Ghost. It wasn't an accident that God saw you and heard you when you were repenting. But the Bible says you're chosen. Now, in case someone's got a little theological gear turning, so well, Pastor, He chooses us because we choose Him. We seek Him and we find Him. That may be true. But you, you understand the principles the same. God likes those who choose to worship Him. He likes those who have a pleasant feeling towards Him. That gives Him a pleasant feeling towards us. And this morning, God saw something in you. God saw something inside of each one of you that got His attention and He said, that is what I'm looking for. I remember the day I saw Sister Duncan. She was wearing a cute little jumper and she was running around with a bunch of, of friends at Bible school and we went to a Burger King and I was just a part of the crowd. And I remember other times that we ran around together and she was dating this one and I was dating others. But we always flirted and we had a good time. And in the back of my mind, I said, I really like her. There was something inside of her that I wanted to choose for my very own. There were other girls. There were other girls I was dating. There were other ones I was running around with as friends. I was giving her a hard time about all the guys that were chasing her. But there was something about her that pleased me on the inside and captivated my attention and made me want to pledge myself to her for the rest of my life to cherish her and hold her and keep her and watch over her 
excuse me, and spend my time with her. Church, this morning, the Bible says we are a chosen generation. We're a bunch of people that God didn't just hook up with. We're not one night stands in His part in the common parlance. We're not just shack ups. We're not common law. We are people that He has chosen and He has brought us to be His bride this morning. We are a chosen people. That gives us special status. It gives us special privileges. It makes us not just somebody. Now, Sister Duncan would ever just go nuts and decide she didn't want to be with me. Or if I would ever just go nuts and decide I didn't want to be with her. You know what? We just can't walk away from each other. It's not that simple. We'd have to get a divorce. We'd have to have paperwork and lawyers and time and legal proceedings. Why? Because when we chose each other, we made a commitment. Church, when God chose you, He made a commitment to you. When God said, I want Him or I want her to be my very own, God committed Himself to you and He filled you with the Holy Ghost when you said, I do. He filled you with the Holy Ghost. It was a down payment on your heavenly inheritance you're going to get someday. It was a ring, if you'll let me say it that way, that He slipped on your finger. It was a token of His promise that He's going to be with you for now and forever. You're chosen. That means He saw something in you that not everybody has. There ain't no junk in the kingdom of God. There's no, oh, I just accidentally stumbled into the church house. Well, you may accidentally stumble in the church house. You may stumble up to a pew, but you're not going to stumble your way into the kingdom of God. Hello? We're chosen people. A royal priesthood. Now, I know we don't do much uh, about this royal thing here. Uh, in our country, but there are nations that still have kings and queens and, and royalty. And uh, we, I guess you could say we have our royalty over here. They just don't we don't call them kings and queens. They're they're either musicians or actors or or uh, you know sports stars. And I'm not saying that all all acting is bad. I'm not saying all sports is bad. That kind of stuff. But there are people in the, all of those possessions who do seem to get the royal treatment, if you will. But a person who is royalty has ten toes and ten fingers, usually, just like the rest of us do. They get dressed the same way. They eat the same types of foods. Maybe prepared differently. Maybe on a silver platter than a, rather than a paper plate. They wear the same kind of clothes. Maybe theirs have more thread per inch. Maybe theirs have fancier types of, uh, uh, of trims and different materials that are harder to come by. But basically, they wear clothes that are the same type of clothes that you and I wear. Why? Because they're just people like we are. So what makes a person royal? It's not physical characteristics. It's not the fact that they wear a certain type of clothing. It's not that they live in a certain type of house. But rather, what made a person a royal member of a household or a, a person would be, have the status of being royalty was the fact that they had a bloodline, a heritage, and their name was the name associated with that bloodline. There are other Duncans in this town. There are other Duncans all around. There are other Keith Duncans in this town. But we're not of the same bloodline. Unless you go back to Adam and Esther or Noah, that's a whole different concept there. We're not of the same family. We don't have the same blood. But the Bible says that we are a royal priesthood. In other words, we are a special priesthood because we are ministering in the priesthood that only has a certain specific bloodline and name. Now, there's other priesthoods in this world. 
there's satanic priesthoods, there's Catholic priesthoods, Episcopalian, and if you go through all different types of religions, and many of them have their, their priests. But there is a specific priesthood that we're a part of. And this is really amazing that he used these two things together because royalty was born royalty. Now you can marry into it and the children become royal because they are half bloodline. Think about how we are. We're just born everyday people. We're commoners. How many of you in here have ever watched Downton Abbey? Anybody? Nobody else in here shares my family's taste for, for British goofy TV shows. I saw part of it and part. didn't like it at all, and I'm not against British, I'm just against the soap opera. <laughs> well, <laughs> Sorry. you can be saved anyway. All right. <laughs> <laughs> the main characters in the show, it's a multi season thing, it's on DVD. I don't. It, it, the first time I saw it, I'm like, seriously? I had that same impression. The second one I watched it, I thought, this is cool. And I was hooked. So sometimes that first impression is not always good. But the interesting, the main part of it is, it centers around a character who the husband was a blue blood in 17th, 18th century England. And it was, a, uh, you know, overall the, uh, the abbey, the, the whole area there. And his wife was an American. And there's always a little family play against all the little British goofiness that goes with their sense of royalty with the nobles and the earls and all that kind of stuff. And don't get me talking about it because I don't know all the details, but I know that they're really high flute and snobby. And Americans were seen as being very uncouth and very common and very just kind of boorish in their eyes. It's kind of funny watching the two cultures interplay between the husband and the wife there. But their children were considered blue buds because they were born into the right family. Do you understand? I know I, I'm showing an example of a parent here that no one here else related to. Forgive me for that. But at least understand this concept. We're commoners. We're everyday people. We're not really special on the outside. There's nothing about our families or our talents or our abilities that sets us apart from anybody else. But yet God chose us and when He chose us, He brought us in. He married us. Uh, he made us part of His family. And because of that, we're not just working as a priest, uh, but we are royalty of His bloodline and carrying His name. Uh, and you families understand what I'm saying this morning here. That gives your children some privileges and opportunities that may not be out there to other children and other families. Uh, so take advantage uh, of everything you can. Now let me just teach for a second. People say, oh, it's just sad. It's stupid to watch someone who doesn't have any specialness about him try to act like he's somebody special. My, my, it was a phrase that was around when I was growing up. I don't know if it's still used or not. Trying to act like somebody come. Oh, trying to act like somebody special that just showed up. It, it is kind of stupid watching someone who's a nobody try to pretend they're just Cats me out. It's another phrase I don't just use anymore. Someone of special status. I see people look at themselves and snickering. Hmm. But you know what's even stupider and sadder? Is with somebody who has status and someone who has privileges and someone who has abilities, when someone who has something about them that's special, when they live below their status and opportunity, I think that's one of the saddest things around. And church, hear me this morning. I bring this out at this point in this message because there are people sitting on pews uh, all over this world uh, that have a privilege and an opportunity because they are a chosen person born into the kingdom of Almighty God. And God's called them to serve as a royal priest uh, to bear His name and to bear His bloodline. And they live low, far deep beneath their opportunity. They should be experiencing the blessings and the peace uh, and the love of God. But they live lives of torment because they don't live up to their position. They seem to not recognize that God 
has done something for them and made them special in this world. This is a holy nation. Now we know that I could both teach for hours on what it means to be holy. I could generate arguments over what it means to be holy. Every church considers it holy. You heard me just say so many times, no church calls itself the unholy church. But the fact remains that every church calls itself holy because there is a universal recognition that if it belongs to God, it's not supposed to be unholy. Right. Right. Can we all agree on that? Right. And by its very definition, in order to be something, means you've got to be unsomething. In other words, if you choose something, you have to unchoose something. You can't just let anybody, anything on your plate back to the buffet and still get what you want. God can't just let you do anything uh, that you want to because we are to be chosen, royal, and holy. In other words, there's some things uh, you've got to leave out as well as there's some things you have to add in. Right. Right. <coughs> holy. Righteous. Justified by His blood and faith and saved by His mercy and grace. But yes, we must follow after peace and holiness. Why? Because God called us to be holy. Why? Because He is holy. No sane thinking husband wants to marry a prostitute and her stay a prostitute. Hello? No sane thinking woman wants to marry a womanizer and he'll stay a womanizer. And likewise, God doesn't want filthy and profane people becoming a part of His royal chosen kingdom of priests and staying unholy, profane people. There is a process by which He sets us apart. And that setting apart makes us holy. And in the King James, it uses a phrase in this verse, uh, peculiar people. And uh, you, we both heard jokes about that. you know, And we know that some are more peculiar than others. And, and on and on it goes. But I am peculiar to Sister Duncan. She's peculiar to me. I'm special to her. She's special to me. We're set apart from one another. You understand that the whole message of this part of this verse is that you are not just anybody. Therefore, you can't just act like anybody. You can't just do things like anybody. Anybody. You can't just live like anybody because you have entered into a relationship that makes you separate and apart from everybody. You are a chosen people. Now, in this verse, it moves from this concept of describing us and it gives us a purpose or a reason. Why are we chosen? Why? Are we royal? Why are we asked to be holy? Why are we set apart, consecrated, made special, unique to Him? Is it just because He wants to take us and sit us on the shelf? Had an aunt, my, my wife's aunt, that's all right, I can't remember what her name was now. I think she's passed. I met her just a few times, but you walk into her house. Salt shakers and pepper shakers everywhere. She collected salt and pepper shakers. They were just, it was what she did. She collected them. 
big ones, little ones, fat ones, skinny ones, pink, yellow, red, blue, pigs, everything you think of that you can make and put holes in to get salt and pepper out of. That's what she had. She was proud of them too. She'd show you her newest ones that she's got. Some folks do that with China dolls. Some folks do that with deer horns. Some folks do that with uh, their music collections. Some folks do it with their, you know, go on and on and on and on. God didn't just save us. He didn't choose us out and make us special and clean us up and, and, and give us a purpose. He has a purpose for you and I. And that purpose is really rather simple. Our whole existence down here as a child of God is that we may proclaim the praises of Him. Well, our purpose is outreach. Proclaim His praise. Right. Our purpose is to, to nurture the saints. Proclaim His praise. He's our provider. He's our healer. He's our watchman. He takes care. Proclaim His praise. Morning, noon, and night. Everything we do. Everything we're about is so that we can proclaim His praise. Now, you can argue all you want to. Words mean something. And we sing a song here and occasionally as a, as a chorus in Scripture. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation, I lost the tune, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto Him. Words of my mouth. Meditations of my heart. Do you know why there's two phrases there divided by connecting word? It's because the meditation of your heart is not praise to God. Oh? Huh? The words of your mouth may be if they are giving you glory and honor. Worship can be silent. But praise is not. There's different words for meditation and prayer too. When you say you're praying silently, no, you're meditating. You're thinking on the Lord. You're thinking about His goodness. You're thinking about His love. You're contemplating Him in your mind. You're not praying. Different words used in the Scripture. Why are they used differently? Because there's a difference between what's being done. Now, I know I've said I'm really slow here. I'm trying to teach when you pray, you call upon the Lord. That's not done just in the mind. That is done vocally. When you sing praise unto God, you do it vocally. If you're just singing in your mind, you're meditating on Him. You're thinking about Him. It's good. It's wonderful. It's the way you should be in your thoughts. But to be accurate, it's not praising Him. How boring would a praise service be if we came in and everybody just sat there and thought good thoughts about God? Why? Because praise is vocal. There's Bible words that describe praise. Clap your hands, O oh you people. Clapping is biblical. Singing is biblical praise. They're expressive. Both make noise out loud. Dancing before the Lord is a biblical expression of praise. Although I will say with an asterisk that probably most dancing before the Lord is done of a certain age group because as we get older, knees and gravity and things take place. and you know, There's more bouncing if it was older. They didn't live as long as we did back then. Or oh, there might have been a scripture about bouncing unto the Lord. 
a jest. But do you understand here? You will never accomplish God's purpose if you are not outwardly expressive in your worship of Him. In other words, if you never vocally give Him praise, if you never physically give Him praise, not only are you not following biblical patterns and instructions for worship, or excuse me, for praise, but you are not accomplishing the purpose that you're called to. That's why the worship leader says, clap your hands or lift your hands up to the Lord or, or sing everybody because those are biblically God-ordained, God-instructed ways of giving Him praise. Uh, and the very reason we come together on Sunday mornings and Thursday nights, uh, one of the reasons we come together is so that we may proclaim the what? The worship? No. The meditation? I don't know. Uh, the good thoughts about Him? No. We come together Together, that we may proclaim the praises That's right. of Him. And it really shouldn't be such a hard thing. Why? I understand why is it gets hard. It gets hard because we're we're flesh and we're human, and sometimes we stay up too late and we come to church tired. And sometimes we have you know we're sick and we don't feel good physically and legitimately. And sometimes we, we just cop attitudes because we're human beings. And and sometimes we have a hard time making this old body do what God wants us to do. But let's be honest with you. There's not very many times that we're so physically bad that we that we can't lift our hands. <laughs> And very few times have I seen folks so sick they couldn't run their mouth. You can take that any way you want to. But I've seen folks that couldn't lift their voice to God in prayer.